do, how do you feel i talk about the role first as just being ceo because i so, also sometimes look at that role and think how daunting it is i look at the ceo today in livingstone and think that it's so challenging as a job there's you know you've got the shareholders at the board you've got um, the carlisle the, the the investment group you've got you know a business that's going through a significant transformation and it's all lying on one person to make the changes and make a lot of decisions. And I just think, wow, I mean, to, to take it on is number one, but also then to try to execute against it. When you look at that role, is there parts of that you find daunting and you think, or, or is it motivating that you can really you look at that big challenge? The hardest part of leadership is people, <clears throat> pure and simple, because people are varied. Uh, they have their own ambitions, um, strengths, areas for development. <clears throat> you, in my case, walk into an existing culture. So I think any role that involves relationships with people is always going to be a challenge. But as a CEO, I think I've always was taught many years ago that a leader's role is to drive improvement through others. So if a CEO thinks, I'm it, I can change everything, <clears throat> it's maybe not likely that they'll succeed. So to build a team around you of, of individuals who uh, are, are certainly capable, <clears throat> um, share your vision, but I think then most importantly are also different from you, uh, is a sound basis for success. So the position I'm in at, as CEO is establishing establishing that. So getting to know the team so that I can build relationships with them. And then within the leadership team, um, build a vision they could subscribe to. Mm -hmm. uh, help me understand how their differences to me can be a real strength in decision making and then empower them to make the improvements or drive the performance for me. <clears throat> and that's the only formula that's ever worked for me. So at the heart of this has to be um, all those really strong interpersonal skills that people look for in a leader. At the one end, you've got effective decision-making and clarity in decision-making. <clears throat> At the other hand, end, you've got that kind of collaborative approach where people feel that their voice is heard and the decisions being made reflect them and they can see their influence on it. And being able to deploy those two ends of the spectrum, which are effectively, this is my decision, go and do it, right through to what do we all think? Is there a consensus here? Okay, I don't necessarily agree with this, but we're going to go with it. Be able to deploy those two ends of the spectrum at the appropriate time, I think, for me personally, is what is always on my mind. And that in my last job, where bar one or two people, I'd appointed everyone mm. or promoted them and, and knew them and all their characteristics. That was a really comfortable position for me. For anyone who goes into a new leadership role, we don't know anybody, working that out and building those relationships, that credibility with that team, that's kind of your first hurdle. And that can take a minimum of a year to effectively do. Wow. How do you feel about the responsibility, knowing that all responsibility, all decisions ultimately come down to yourself? And of course, you're having to make a decision. Quite often, you don't have all of the information. And, and I don't know how you would make a lot of those decisions without, you know, there's, there's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be missing information. How do you feel about that responsibility? Um... <clears throat> I suppose I'm used to it and you could, the pandemic is an extreme example of finding yourself in a position of leadership where there is nobody who can say, oh, I've been through this. Mm. And you are drawing upon everything that's gone in your life before that might give you the tiniest fraction of confidence of what you do next. So the responsibility is, of course, significant. But you're only going to succeed as a leader if you're comfortable taking on that responsibility. 
if 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 you're not quit <laughs> so when when i'm in a position and you don't have the full facts you are kind of trying to draw upon everything that's happened before to fill in the gap and then when there's still a gap and you've got to make a decision all I can pull it does just down to it is a quality that you you have in leaders that first and foremost even without all the facts they will make a decision as opposed to prevaricate as opposed to devolve responsibility so they will make a decision and they'll be able to explain why they've made that decision and the simple fact for any CEO or any leader is we don't always know. Mm. It is a percentage of certainty or probability that comes into your head and a willingness to be wrong. Not a desire, clearly, but a willingness to understand I might get this wrong. But at the moment in time, based on what I know now and based on all my experience, this decision I think is the right one. So that leads me to a question, actually, because what happens if you don't make the decision? What's the impact on the, the people, the team? If there's indecision at the leadership level, what then happens? Drift. The organisation drifts. There's um, a really good film, one of my favourite called, it's got Rus Russell Crowe called Master and Commander. Mm. It's captain of a ship, early 19th century. And there's an officer on board who's not very effective. <clears throat> It's not popular and there's an incident and he goes to the captain's uh, cabin and he explains to the captain, you know, I'm trying to be friendly with the crew. And the captain says, they don't want friends, they want leadership. <laughs> so the absence of decision making, j just it leads to drift. Um, your team will resent you, <clears throat> you will be considered weak and you'll ultimately fail and probably fail quite horribly because ultimately that is the job the job of leadership is to make decisions i, th I think I, I think um one of the mistakes i made when i started moving into leadership was that friends piece and of course you need to be a leader how do you think you get the right balance between getting on with the team but also then leading the team at the same time and is there a how do you get that balance between the two because you of course you Sometimes having, um, what am I thinking of, uh, like uh, constructive tension is a good idea, is a good thing. I certainly can do that with my customers. But having that with my team, I find that really challenging to have that, to challenge someone or to push someone a bit. But then there's also that, that point just around we're getting on well. And I made the mistake at the beginning of sort of mates and, you know, we go out and we'll have a few drinks or we'll do this. And I just thought, this doesn't feel right to me. Sure. And so what, how do you get that balance right? It is a common quandary for all leaders. And I have a couple of phrases. The first is, um, you can be friendly, but you're not friends. Mm. <clears throat> and there's a big difference between the two. Because really the only thing that unites people in a workplace is your contract of employment. It's a professional place. <clears throat> people are there to do a particular job. And obviously being able to do that in a friendly atmosphere is far better than an unfriendly one. But beyond that, that is it. Now, people of a similar level will become friends, of course. <clears throat> but ultimately, if you are the CEO or a leader or manager, you will be called upon to make decisions that impact adversely on anybody in the organization. You cannot be seen to favor somebody and you cannot find yourself in a position where a friend is a person you need to make redundant. <clears throat> uh, and, and their accusation to you is, I thought we were friends. So the reason, there's a reason to say it's lonely at the top, because it is lonely at the top. You cannot manage through friendship, but you can be friendly. You mentioned adversity. And before we talk about what I really want to talk to you about, which was diversity role models, but let's talk about the, the, um, the adversity you've been through. Maybe we'll talk through COVID. How did your, in your previous organization, how did you cope with COVID? With, cause I, I know there was quite a significant change, I think in your business previously and what happened there. 
I think with people working from home, going from the office, I think there was a, obviously just like all organisations, you know, yeah. starting remote. I remember I was, I was working, working with one of my larger clients at the time and um, a large global bank and they were about 100,000 employees. I was talking to them about digital transformation and also just you know transforming how people work. And um, the feedback that they said was that well, we were trying to promote working from home, um, you know, for, for lots of different benefits. And and they said over a quarter of a weekend we went from ten thousand home workers to a hundred thousand home workers, and um, they just they just had to deal with it. There was no other choice. They just had to make that change. How how did you implement some of those changes, and how did you find the COVID scenarios? Um, how did they play out for you? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. It was necessary to go from being a wholly classroom-based, face-to-face training organisation to, to, to wholly remote. Mm. And because the organisation contracted with the government, there wasn't really the option to put people on furlough. <clears throat> we had to continue trading. Um but we were sort of caught in a little bit of a trap because the contract relied just as much on doing the existing work. Our business relied on being able to bring in new work as well. And the new work simply stopped. Right. So it put great strain over the organization's cash flow. I described it to the team as our model is a bucket <clears throat> with a hole at the bottom and a tap. And so long as the water coming in is at least the same as the water going out, we're fine. But under COVID, the tap was switched off. So there's still water in the bucket, but you can just see draining, draining, draining. <clears throat> so for us, the challenge was we have our existing obligations. We've got several hundred apprentices we need to continue to train. And each of those apprentices have their own issues because of em employers who may be putting them on furlough experiencing their own difficulties <clears throat> and at the same time we have absolutely no new business coming in and we have no idea when that new business will come in so you from my perspective you kind of distill it down to that to that image which is we'll just run out of money we can't we can't put people on furlough because th the government has issued a contract to us and says you must fulfill the contract so your costs are fixed, but your income is just vanishing before you. So it's a kind of acutely unusual problem compared to the charity I work for now. Everybody but the CEO went on furlough. <clears throat> they just wow. kind of froze all their outgoings as well as having a lot of their income frozen. But we were in a sandwich in a much less um, flexible position. So it had a, a significant effect operationally. We had to switch very quickly to a remote delivery, as did many, many organizations. We weren't unique in that. But also had to make some pretty sharp decisions about how could we buy time. And I would say on March the 20th or whenever it was that lockdown was initiated, I said, we're no longer in the business of training. We're in the business of buying time. We need to staunch that hole where the money's going out until some sort of plan is put in place, either at that stage, of course, some of us have probably thought, oh, this will be over by June. Uh, or um, yeah, the, the government looks more broadly than it was doing at that stage. So it was a really acute problem. I think for any CEO or anyone in a position of leadership, um, it tested to your maximum every piece of resilience you'd built up mm. what lessons have you taken from that because you you've had to have talking about it's going to be a three-month period at the beginning that's what a lot of us thought there's a lot of us hoped i mean i think the first lockdown was two weeks and then it started to change and it was a bit longer and of course that that that, that period really increased when you were looking at the longevity of how long it actually ended up lasting for, how did you last is the question, I suppose. How did you, how did you allow the, how did you make the organisation to be resilient enough to be able to have the longevity to get through it ultimately? Um, I realised the only way we could buy time was to significantly 
reduce outgoings, but at the same time were tied into fulfilling our obligations. So I persuaded everyone to take a pay cut, a significant pay cut for wow. six months. How, how was that received? I think we went through a process where people understood if we didn't do that, then you could potentially be talking about reducing roles. And in any small organization, it's usually um, close knit. There are these strong interpersonal relationships, which you think are essential. Um, and people didn't want that to happen to their colleagues. Um, so it was an acceptance of two choices. Um, and everybody, myself included, it was across the board, everyone taking a pay cut was the least worst option. Um, and you talk about it collectively, obviously online, and then you spend time with each individual because it was a choice. We chose not to say you will. It was very much a persuasion. Right. And, you know, to their absolute credit, nobody refused. Everybody felt the same, which was we need to keep this organization going. Uh, we fulfill uh, charitably a very key function in the local community. We believe this is short term. So we're taking pay cuts for a limited period. And I gave the commitment that should there be a bounce back that we would repay that sacrifice, which eventually we're able to do. But of course, at the time, it does seem like a, a somewhat of a, a cursory promise. You have absolutely no idea, even if what you're doing is enough, never mind, could you pay it back? So it comes back down to that, that relationship piece, having having in uh, being able to articulate the problem in ways that people can really understand and empathize with, um, reassure them that you, you know, it, this isn't, we're just going to do this and hope for the best that there is a plan <clears throat> and re-emphasize that what you're asking of everyone, you are doing exactly the same so that people feel the leader is right in it with them. I think that's an important thing, isn't it? That leadership is there in the trenches with them because they don't want there to be, you can't have some disparity there. You've, you've got you've to act yeah. in exactly the same way. And I've never been a person to sit in an office on my own. I've always sat right in it with everybody to build. I think you get, a, I think there's a, a kind of, kind of a, a managerial asset which is pick up on lots of informal communication and intelligence which is very helpful setting an office i think you can be quite isolated from that mm. um, you can see problems coming earlier than if before it gets escalated to you and you can intervene but i think the greatest message is that feeling of i don't consider myself anything other than part of the team 